They pass a lot of laws that get out of control by the executive branch and the judicial branch, but the, the Congress uh, neglects the responsibility, say, in protecting sound money. The Constitution is very clear. We're supposed to have only gold and silver as legal tender. We're not allowed to emit bills of credit, which is paper money, and there's no authority to have a central bank. That is the Federal Reserve. If we had a constitutional government, we would not have a Federal Reserve that could print money out of thin air and bail out all their cronies without <laughs> from the people through a vote by their congressmen and their senators. That is the way we're supposed to go to war. Under those conditions, it's more thoughtful, more cautious. We go rarely. And if we're attacked, as we were in World War II, obviously there was a response within a few hours a day uh, of, of the uh, attack, as well as Germany declaring war against us. We declared war against both those countries and won that war in about four years. And here now, we have gone into war carelessly and casually. Korea, we went in under the UN banner. We really didn't win that war. We didn't advance our na national security. And tragically, we're still involved. We're still having troops in Korea. I think it's time to bring them home. <laughs>
is rather clear. Uh, the government should be open. We should know what the government is doing. It should not be doing things in secret. But they fight secret wars. Congress has difficulty finding out. The Federal Reserve is uh, kept in secret. They, they literally deal in trillions of dollars. Their budget is bigger than the whole Congress budget. And the Congress doesn't assume the responsibility of oversight. The one reason they don't want oversight is if we found out what they've been doing, they know their days would be limited because people would just be furious about how, how they manage and take care of their friends. And they certainly did that in the bailing out after, uh, in 2008 after the, uh, the, the markets uh, crashed. But our personal liberties under these conditions are systematically being attacked. Uh, it, uh, it, not only is it it's a Patriot Act that allows uh, searches uh, and seizures of our private papers and our telephone records and our houses uh, without search warrants. And if somebody, if a federal official comes in and searches our house and they uh, come across an individual and they got it, they know they, the individual knows the government's been in the house, that individual cannot tell anybody. If they tell anybody, if they tell their friends or neighbors, their wives or their lawyer, they will have committed a crime. So government wants protection of their secrecy and they have undermined our privacy. It should be the other way around. You should have the protection of privacy. The government should be open so that we know what they're doing. There is that uh, consequence of loss of liberties in time of war and we are uh, you know, experiencing that under the conditions that we have today uh, because we're taught to be in perpetual fear of what might happen. But uh, the, uh, the, the, civil, the, the war though has gone on for these many years in, in the Middle East for 10 years now. The, the current wars have added $4 trillion worth of debt uh, to our national debt in these last 10 years. It has not made us freer. It has not done that. It has made us poorer, and it has undermined our liberty. So we have to look at our foreign policy as an economic issue, as a moral issue, a constitutional issue, a national defense issue. And if we look at that carefully, I am convinced we would go down on the side of saying we have too many wars going on. We have our troops spread around the world too thinly. And if we are worried about borders, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and we're spending money and lives to worry about that border. What about a border? Why don't we worry a little bit more about our borders to the south of us and take care of ourselves here at home? <laughs> so a lot of money could be saved by changing foreign policy. People say, whoa, that means you're, not, you're going to be weak on defense. I've been on the receiving end of that charge. <laughs> but I tell you what, if you're fighting wars that make no sense, and people are dying, and you're not safer, you're spending money on militarism and not on defense, it's not making us safer. It's making us more vulnerable. So I would say that the most important thing to do when you talk about the expenditures overseas and what we do with the military is separate the two expenditures. One is military spending for the purpose of military and maybe subsidizing the military industrial complex, and the other spending is the national defense spending. And we spend enough on national defense. We are safe militarily. Nobody's going to attack us. We have more weapons than everybody, everybody around that in, in, in the world uh, put together. We still have the weapons that we had that where we could have thwarted anything the Soviets threw, threw at us. But there's nobody even close to being able to uh, attack us. And, uh, and, and yet, the spe expenditures go up. Some people say, well, yeah, that, that doesn't sound very Republican. Uh, but isn't it conservative? You know, to watch how you spend your money? I thought that was Republican. You know, watch how you spend your money. <laughs> presidential candidates have advocated, but we don't end up with the policy. Matter of fact, in the year 2000, it was a significant year. You know, I was watching carefully uh, because there was a chance we would win the House and the Senate and the presidency, which we did. But uh, I um, you know, thought, thought the uh, program that uh, President uh, Kennedy Bush at the time said, 
Well, we should have a humble foreign policy. We should not do this nation building like Bill Clinton was doing. Uh, we should not get involved in the internal affairs of other nations. We shouldn't be the policeman of the world. That sounds like a pretty good foreign policy to me. And uh, yet now people are saying, no, if you don't support the war, if you, if you cut back on one penny, you don't support the troops. I hear that all the time. You gotta vote for this to support the troops. But there's one little statistic that ought to refute that once and forever. And that is the fact is, what is a military, what does a military per that personnel think about that? And it turns out that if you look at the statistics, they're very, very clear. The top three categories of where our campaign gets the money is, is first, it's the Air Force, then the Army, <coughs> and then the Navy. And when you add it up, we get twice as much money as all the other candidates put together from active military personnel. <laughs> This policy of being uh, isolationist are the ones who are much more isolationist. Isolation is usually trade barriers and putting on the sanctions and not working with diplomacy and not working with nations and trying to uh, at least work out some problems. And they're the ones who say this is isolationism, but they're, they're the first ones to have sanctions on country. Sanctions frequently, if not always, lead to war. We had sanctions on Iraq for a long time. And they had nothing to do with 9-11. There was no al-Qaeda there. The sanctions finally led to war because that is what we wanted to do. That was our policy. It had been around a long time. But uh, we should be more open to trade. The founders advised us about this. It's a congressional responsibility to deal with trade, not international governments like the WTO and the UN. They're not supposed to be responsible for that. So uh, we should be more open to trade. When I was drafted, with the Cuban crisis in 1962, we had reason to be concerned about the conditions because the Soviets were putting missiles in Cuba. But that's a long time ago. I think it's time we talk to the Cubans, trade with the Cubans, travel to Cuba, and become friends with the Cubans. initiate a war against the country. You know, now we're in the preemptive, preventive war stage where we literally start the battles and, and, and go in. But um, we need to think about what has happened on these crises in the past. Uh, in 1962, it was in the process of me being sworn into the Air Force because the missile crisis resolved rather quickly. And fortunately, uh, as I look back now, I was very happy now to know that uh, Jack Kennedy called up Khrushchev to try to avoid a nuclear exchange. I mean, it was probably the most dangerous moment in the history, of, maybe of the history of the world, certainly of the 20th century. But he called up Khrushchev, and he says, well, what are we gonna do about this? And uh, Khrushchev, uh, you know, pointed out, he put you know, missiles on our border, why can't we have missiles on your border? And Kennedy, was, his response was, well, maybe we can make a deal. So Kennedy said, I'll take the missiles out of Turkey. They're right on your border. If you take them out of Cuba, they agreed to it, and it was resolved. I don't see anything wrong with that. I, I think that talking to people before we start killing each other makes a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Uh, properly. But right now, it hasn't stopped. 
we, we sometimes think that all we need to do is buy our friends around the world. So we go to dictators, whether a dictator or not is, is irrelevant. If we find a friendly dictator, we started in 1953, we had the Shah of Iran. So we propped him up. Didn't make the Iranian people very happy. It radicalized them against us, and that's when they overthrew the Shah in 1979. So uh, there are ramifications from that, but we haven't stopped. And, and this is not the American people's fault other than the fact that we have allowed uh, our policymakers to do this. The American people aren't guilty of the crime as much as policymakers are doing the wrong thing. That's why I want to change, uh, change these policies. So uh, we, we gave uh, for probably 35 years or so, we gave Mubarak in Egypt over $40 billion. And he was to be obedient, do what we tell him, and, and not invade Israel. The people said, well, that's a pretty good trade-off. Uh, but it's, an, it's a false trade-off. Because we're not going to be able to buy people off for a long time. We're going to run out of money, one thing. But also, the people in those countries run out of patience. Just as the Iranian people ran out of patience with our dictator, the Egyptian people did. And rightfully so. I probably would have been on the side of getting rid of that dictator. But we were propping him up. It was our money. So what's happening in Egypt, and Tunisia, and Algeria, and all these countries right now, Libya, what has happened there is the governments that are taking over are more radical. The Islamists are being uh, are more likely to be in charge as well as the Al Qaeda. So long term, there's been a disadvantage to this. I think this is very dangerous to Israel because if we, when we run out of money, and when these these uh, governments change again, this makes Israel uh, more vulnerable. And uh, I, I think it, too often it backfires on on all of us. So it's well attended, and people think you can buy buy protection and buy friendships that way. But I think there should be something different offered to other countries as we talk and try to be friends with countries. On the one hand, we get the dictators, we give money. On the other hand, they don't do what we tell them. We attack them with drone missiles and bombs. So I would say, why don't why don't we try an old-fashioned way and just uh, do what the founders said: I offer friendship and trade with any nation that would want it. Still, there are going to be dangerous people around the world, and there are plenty right now. Some people believe that uh, Iran is the dangerous nation. Uh, Iran doesn't have a nuclear missile, but they're not on the verge of it. The talk is warm and soft, just like we do in Afghanistan, Iraq. But we shouldn't ignore it. I mean, I don't want them to have a nuclear missile. Uh, nuclear bombs. I don't want, matter of fact, I'd like to see most of the countries get rid of them. We'd all be better off with a lot less nuclear weapons. <laughs> we have enough nuclear weapons ourselves probably to blow up the world 10 or 20 times. I don't think we need more uh, more nuclear missiles. So I would like to do it, uh, to do whatever we can to discourage people from doing it. Sometimes they want to be in self defense, sometimes they get more respect from their neighbors if they do have weapons. Because we treated Libya different. They were working on one. We finally talked Libya out of it. And then look what happened to him. We talked to him out of the web. So uh, we, we should work in that capacity. I mean, we don't worry about uh, Canada getting a nuclear weapon because you know, our, you know, our relationships are different. So uh, it, it's that that we have to, have to work on. Uh, but if a country does get them and it became a threat, there's no Soviet empire out there right now. There's nobody going to invade us. There's nobody's going to lob a missile on us. But if there is a country that does that, what we did with the Soviets wasn't the worst thing. When push came to shove, we actually talked to them. Matter of fact, the Soviet system was undermined as well as the communists were undermined because changes were occurring. We talked more and more and more and sort of opened, uh, opened up the doors. So I think that, uh, that is what the, the, the approach is. But if they have missiles and we still can't trust them, we don't even want to talk to them, well, th there were years um, that we didn't do too much talking. Uh, but we try to contain them, understand them, be able to defend ourselves and work, work out of it. And if we can contain the Soviet system until they go bankrupt and they have all those weapons, 
you think we could hint they're a third world nation that has a lot of oil, but they can't even produce enough gasoline for their automobiles. I would think that we shouldn't be so intimidated that we're looking to start another war. I'm voting, and I will not endorse another war unless somebody attacks us and if we get a declaration of war by the Congress.
So the uh, we, we did that for a long time uh, until the point got, until we got to the point uh, of 2008. We had corrections along the way and uh, spending more money and printing more money seemed to help, and they would come out of the mild recession. But this is a big one. This is real big because the debt is unsustainable. The debt, this debt is worldwide. The dollar, we have had this privilege of issuing the reserve currency. Everybody takes our dollars and put it in the bank as if it's gold. So we asked to get in, in, uh, export our inflation and it causes problems for other countries, but it causes, it gives us a benefit. All we have to do is print money, we get to buy cheap goods. Sounds like a pretty good deal until all the jobs go overseas, and until the debt gets so big you can't do it anymore. And that's where we are today. Our jobs are overseas, production is down, we're not cutting back on spending, the deficit is unsustainable because it's paying the interest on the debt is going to uh, be impossible. And, uh, and, and now it's worldwide. The countries, the states that uh, in many parts of our country are in debt, cities are in debt, but the world governments are in debt in Europe, I mean Greece, and Italy, and Spain. But guess what? We're getting hot for that because the banks bought that debt. They thought they could make a quick buck and it collapsed and uh, the, say the Greek debt probably isn't worth anything, maybe 25 cents on a dollar or less, but the banks are holding that. And they don't, they're telling us, well, if you don't bail out <coughs> the banks, this is going to be a worldwide calamity, and they're going to suffer. I say the people who've been making the money, and they're in trouble, I would say let them go bankrupt, not dump it on to the people. In the yeah.
collapse for economic reasons. And we will collapse as well for economic reasons because we're spending way too much. So my suggestion in the first year, what I would propose and push hard for is to cut the budget by one trillion dollars in one year. Yeah.
more easily on his overseas spending, better than anything else and not a domestic program. Now, I would cut domestic programs, but this is what I would preserve until we became a more prosperous country where we could work our way out of it. I would work very hard to meet the contract with Social Security. That was a contract with the government and the people. And they're already getting cheated because they're getting money back that doesn't buy as much. I would want to protect the medical care for the elderly and medical care for the innocent children. But for so much of the rest, you know, we can start coming back and we have to release this creative economic energy that we have. So that means we have an environment where the jobs will come back here. It does change law and need to change monetary policy. A strong signal would be sent by just returning our military to this country. A strong signal would be if we cut a trillion dollars, people know that we're serious. If we would cut the taxes, can we have a huge tax on corporations that have money parked overseas? They made it overseas, but they bring it back, we tax them. So why should they be taxed twice? They were taxed overseas. Other countries don't do that. So we want to invite capital back here. We have to create the conditions where they create the jobs. Governments can't create the jobs, but the government is responsible for destroying the environment that makes people quit, you know, causes the business cycle, as well as chasing people over, overseas. And so it is a significant <coughs> undertaking, and it's along with the uh, elimination of the bad debt and the malinvestment and the mistakes that made. Now, I, I mentioned about dumping all that on the taxpayer. We have to stop doing that, but we still have to deal with liquidation of debt. Uh, and, and that means people either have to pay it off or they have to go bankrupt. And if you back off and you don't, if you quit bailing out, it's going to take about a year for that to happen. If we'd have done that in 2008, it would have been over with. The housing prices would have done, gone down sharper, maybe sharper, <coughs> faster, but it would have been over a year. And this is what happened in 1921 before we decided that we were going to go with modern economics. We didn't bail out anybody in the Depression after World War I. It was rather short and sharp, and it, it was, uh, it was uh, over with. But in the Depression, we adapted to these modern economic rules, and that prolonged the agony of the Depression and lasted until well after uh, World War II. So we have to allow that to happen. But then, all we have to do is get some confidence back in ourselves. We have to have a sound currency. Today, the government, the Federal Reserve manipulates. They say, well, interest rates have to be low so the banks can borrow the money. They borrow the money for free, and then they buy big government debt, and they make bundles. So what happens to the people who save and say that, well, I'm trying my best to take care of myself. I'm scared of the stock market. I don't know what to do. I have my CD. What do you get, 1 or 2% on your CDs? If you had the market rate, it might be 5%. And I brought this to the attention of Greenspan and Bernanke. And I said, this isn't helpful. This doesn't help the people who are saving. But they said, yeah, I agree with you, but there's not much we can do. And we have to you know, do what we believe in. They acknowledge it, but figure that somebody has to pay a price and just literally ignore it. The market would take care of the interest rates that the savers would be taking care of. And it, it helps people who want to take care of themselves. The same way with these students that are graduating from college. Yes, they borrowed too much money. They owe a trillion dollars now. But the most important thing we can do is not bail them out again as much as get them a job, you know, and let them pay the <laughs> debt. <laughs> Our country has, has been, in the past, the richest country. We've had the largest middle class, and uh, we've had the maximum amount of freedom. Today, even statistically, when they look at the different nations, we're not in that category anymore. We have a lot of apparent prosperity, but we have a lot of debt behind it. It's all based on debt. In the past, even in the Depression, uh, we had bad times, but we were a creditor nation. Now we owe all this money to foreign governments, China and Japan, and we have this huge national debt. So it's, it's, based, it's based on, on debt, <coughs> and uh, therefore, uh, we have to, you know, restore this confidence where we can get back to producing wealth once again. But freedom, freedom hasn't been around all that long. Our country has had a great experience with it. The last hundred years, we've been careless and we've allowed too much of it to slip away. Our, our personal liberties, uh, our intrusion on our privacy, our right to our privacy, and, uh, and the way our foreign policy has changed. So we have been careless with this. But we still, we still have a tradition that we could go to. We have our constitution. We, 
knew once what sound money was all about. We know what property rights should be. The Soviet system didn't even understand that, and they had a rough time. I don't think we'd have that rough a time. All we have to do is know and understand and have this confidence once we can. But freedom over the centuries or the millennium has been very sparse thus far, so there's not very much of it. But when it's tried, you get the maximum amount of prosperity. I am convinced in my own heart that if I had a choice between have being a free person in a free country and I could run my life as I see fit, even if I had less of a, 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 a less standard of living, if my standard of living went down, I would opt to be a free person.
in many ways, it's a uh, political revolution to change these ideas, but it's an intellectual revolution. But I, it's a change in ideas about economic policy, understanding our traditions about our foreign policy, understanding monetary policy. Because this is where we're making progress. This is where you have advanced so much over the last couple decades, and even in the last four years. So I am encouraged by that. I do not know what the future will bring. bring but I do know that a message can be sent, and uh, hopefully uh, a message can be achieved in this election, this campaign, maybe on Tuesday, who knows? I don't know what the result will be, but I am optimistic that we're moving in the right direction and that many people are awakening now to the need for more liberty and less government. Amen. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 